Zach Laws of Bell Derby here with Bob Shaw, production designer of Martin Scorsese's new film, The Irishman. And Bob, I mean, this is such a expansive, epic film. I mean, you've got several, I, I mean, dozens, if not over a hundred locations uh, spanning over 50 years. Uh, I mean, what did you think the first time you read the script, just as like from a, from a pure production design level? Well, actually, we had... Um 295 uh, locations. Oh, and wow. We built, <laughs> and we, we built 28 sets. And um, the first read uh, made it quite clear how, how expansive the project was and not only how many locations there were and how many things that had to be found, but often what a brief period of time we would spend in any of these given locations that we would uh, find something and, and get it ready and put it into the appropriate period and then it would be like just a flash on the screen. So uh, that was clear right away. And our producer, uh, Richard Barada, was a former location manager, and he knew exactly how much time we were going to have to spend scouting. So Kip Myers, our location manager, and I spent oh, at least three months uh, just scouting and driving around before the rest of the production even started to get up and running. Mm hmm so, I mean, you mentioned uh, the number of locations. What's most interesting about this movie, uh, obviously, Martin Scorsese is known for doing his mob films, but this one is so different from the likes of, like, Goodfellas, because uh, if I were to describe it, it would be almost like a working man's mob movie, you know, because it's about, like, a, a lower-level guy, uh, the Robert De Niro character. Can you talk a little bit about how that affected your design choices? Well, the first thing that Marty said to me... Uh, when I had a first meeting with him, it's like, well, basically this film should look like nothing. And, you know, I paused for a moment and said, oh, okay. <laughs> and, but he meant that it was very um, everyday and it was uh, uh, nothing elevated, that their lives were, were indeed very ordinary. And um, to me, one of the interesting things that the, that the film sort of shows is that these people led an incredibly compromised lifestyle. They were constantly looking over their shoulder. It was almost a given that they would end up in prison at some point uh, or do a certain amount of time in, at school, <laughs> as yes. they say, and um, if they didn't end up being killed. And in exchange for this, they led extremely ordinary lives, and they had very uh, unpretentious, um, just sort of middle-class to working-class sort of houses. And uh, it, it definitely is the question of, and, and why did they do all of this? Yeah. Um, it's also, I mean, based on uh, a real-life guy, uh, Frank Shear and the Irishman of the title, um, and also, you know, Russell Buffalino and Jimmy Hoffa are all real-life people. So did you have any kind of access to photographs or, or anything like that that could help you in your research for, for how to design the, the homes and locations of these real-life people? Well, what's interesting is that usually when you start a project with Scorsese, you are given a list of films to watch and that most of the references are a shot in this film and a moment in that film. And uh, this was mostly uh, news footage and, and, uh, and newspaper articles and, and more documentary-like research, not that we were really doing it in a documentary style, um, but there was a lot of very, very strong reference and, and, and things that we endeavored to, to duplicate, except for when we decided not to duplicate something. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll dive into that a little bit more. Just tell us some of the things that you saw in that research that kind of like jumped out at you. Well, in this particular case, it was a, a script that spoke to me the first time I read it. Sometimes you have to read things through several times before they start coming into focus or before you find the key that sort of unlocks the look for you. This happened to be sort of familiar territory for me from family background. My, my mother was from South Philadelphia, Italian. I always say she was my Italian passport to working with Marty. And... Um, and the area that Frank was from, my father had relatives who lived there. The whole uh, thing of Russell Bufalino's front for his illegal activities, you know, the, the pen and drape curtain shop. My grandmother was from Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, which was the original scripted location for the pen and drape shop. And her brothers had a lingerie store <laughs> that really did not sell a lot of lingerie. 
Right. And, um, and, and apparently, you know, I didn't know them. They were bookies. And this lingerie shop was just a front. And there were so many details um, that came to mind just reading the script the first time. And, you know, Frank's first house, I thought, well, that looks like my grandmother's house. And, you know, I, I felt I knew what kind of kitchen table there was. I felt I knew what the sugar bowl looked like. Um, I mean, it was a, I, I said to Regina Graves, our, our decorator, we have to have the sugar bowl and it's got a hinged lid and there's a little slot where the spoon goes. Because I remember always getting yelled at as a kid because I would lift this little hit on, <laughs> on this sugar bowl and then get yelled at or have my hand slapped. And, um, you know, it, it's the kind of thing that I know Marty likes to have that level of, uh, of, of uh, realism or, or that kind of personal touch. Um, he likes to have it just to know that it's right. He likes to have it so that the place feels familiar to the actors. And, um, but this one came into focus for me pretty clearly and very early on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it sounds like you had a lot more like real life experience than one would think in a story about uh, a mob hitman. <laughs> well, I I always say that I'm I'm the stealth Italian on the uh, on, on on these projects because uh, it was the same thing when I worked on The Sopranos um, that uh, you know I my mother was Italian, my father was Irish, my father was the same physical build and sort of similar to to Frank in a way, but that. Um, so everyone's like, well, why, why do you know what's in an Italian person's basement in South Philadelphia? <laughs> so it was, uh, you know, but there were certain things, that, like I pointed out to Marty that I remember, you know, a picture of my mother uh, on, on their, my parents' wedding day, standing on the stoop of the house in, in South Philadelphia. And there was this funny thing that they would paint the house numbers on the brick on the house. It wasn't a plaque. It wasn't applied numbers. They would paint it. And it was on the diagonal. And he was like, oh, great, we have to do that. <laughs> so, you know, I just sort of knew a lot of those details. Uh, so given the, uh, the the sheer number of sets, I mean, you mentioned close to 300, and I think you said you built about 28 or something in there. Um, I mean, how do you pull that off in the amount of time that you need? I mean, how do you make the decision about what's going to be a, a, a set location, uh, what's going to be uh, a real location, what's going to be built, uh, and how do you get all those elements to come together uh, so that you can, you know, get this film shot appropriately. Well, we try to decide as, as early as possible and, and as accurately as possible what should be built and what should be a location. Uh, in the case of the Villa de Roma, which was one of our main sets, um, Marty really felt pretty strongly to begin with that this was not something we were going to be able to find. You know, he kept saying, and I've said to many other people that you, you can smell the, the, the gravy and the floorboards and a place like this that's lived in and a place like that that's probably been around since the 1920s or something like that would be very hard to, to, to create and get that feeling that it was lived in. However, I think we had 10 days of shooting there and it just wasn't going to be feasible to shut down a restaurant, um, take probably two to four weeks to transform it into this 1950s feel and, and then shoot there and then restore it. Um, so it always seemed fairly clear we were going to have to build that. And the challenge was to come up with as many touches um, to make it feel lived in and to make it feel real um, to Marty and to the actors. And, um, you know, there were a lot of off notes, I say, that sort of make something feel more realistic. Uh, there was a location that we scouted for one of the secondary restaurants that all of the plumbing, like the main waistline from the building, was running down the wall right in the middle of the of the of the dining room. And they had attempted to kind of paint it to match the wall, hoping that no one would notice there was this big drain pipe going down the, the wall. And then they cut a hole in the back of the baguette and it just sort of disappeared. And it's like, well, we have to do that. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I had kept for a while a, a file of, um, uh, of, of cracked he hexagonal floors. Um, you, you feel with period filmmaking that it gets harder every year. And that you, you, at the end of the year, you go, I, I did something once um, uh, that was similar to the, the in memoriam at the, uh, at the Oscars. And I, I did a little thing on, on, on Facebook saying, let us pause and think about those that we've lost this year. But it was like old restaurants that <laughs> and and locations that 
that we loved and places that we like to like to you know shop to, to source certain materials that were closing and um uh there was a um a restaurant on second avenue uh first avenue sorry not far from where i used to live um called um lanza's and it had this fantastic uh tile floor but it was so cracked and it was so un uneven because uh it had been around since the 20s, and I had made a point of going in and photographing the floor before the place closed, knowing that someday I, I would need those photographs, and we referenced those um, on uh, The Irishman, and there was a restaurant in um, Cobble Hill, I think, that was called Monty's, and um, it had these murals painted on the wall, and uh, that's another place that's no longer there. Um, but that I had taken some photographs. Um, but I sort of combined that with, um, I think it's the Green Mill. It's a restaurant in Chicago, which I believe is still there. And they had they had murals on the wall, but they were more like paintings, and they were framed. And so I sort of put Monty's and the Green Mill in a blender and came up with the look for our um, for our uh, murals or, or paintings, whatever you want to call them. And similarly, I had photographed... Um, different uh, acoustic tile ceilings that were, um, you know, the one foot square things that they glued to the ceiling, they're like tongue and groove. And then, you know, there's a plumbing emergency and part of the ceiling is discolored and droops. And, you know, I had as many references to make it, you know, sort of off kilter. And even um, we scouted a place um, where we actually had lunch. And I noticed that, on all of the air conditioning um, intake vents, there was a layer of dust, and then there was a layer of grease that trapped more dust in another layer, and they they were just covered with this gray fuzz. I said, well, we have, we have to do that. And <laughs> you, you, couldn't, um, you couldn't see uh, it necessarily on film, but, uh, you know, Marty could see it, and you know probably from the from the banquet that they were in for most of the scenes, um, you know I'm sure the actors could see it, and so anything like that to to make it feel realistic. Uh, and interestingly, the 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 actual Villa de Roma um, still exists in Philly. It's a very boxy restaurant. It's a complete box. It has some kind of veneer uh, brick on the wall, and it's the kind of place that has. Um, uh, the menu is like one of those black and white felt boards with the white letters that are attached. Mm -hmm. And um, it didn't say 50s. It didn't say mob. It didn't say, <laughs> you know, a lot of the things we wanted to say. So as accurately as we tried to approach most of the scenes, there were certain cases where we just felt that, that real wasn't cinematic enough. I mean, we had done the same thing on Boardwalk Empire, the, um, the hotel that... Um, Steve Buscemi's character lived in was the most plain brick box of a hotel on the entire boardwalk, the, uh, the Ritz. And so we intentionally decided, well, we're going to have to do something a little more that captures the imagination a little more. So no matter how realistic you're trying to be, there are certain times when you have to say this just isn't enough or it doesn't say enough. Right. You've worked with Scorsese a number of times, including Boardwalk Empire, which you mentioned, and also Wolf of Wall Street. What's that collaboration like between the two of you? Um, I feel it gets better all the time because with anybody, you, you develop a, a shorthand. And certainly with Marty, I think one of the things we have in common is a love of trivia, a love of detail, a love of you know, the arcane fact uh, I always say that Marty is the most intellectually curious person I've ever met. Um, everyone knows, of course, that he's the encyclopedia of film, um, but he's engaged by everything and um, sort of trying to find things that are going to appeal to him or, or make something click with him. Um, uh, becomes you know part of the process and working with someone multiple times you f you feel a little bit more keyed into to what they're looking for and um, you know the Irishman was so long that there was no way that we would be fully prepped up front so there was an ongoing thing of um, waiting outside his trailer with my binder of you know the stuff that pertained to the next week or the next couple of weeks work 
and um, he would always sit down and go, what do we got? <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it just became a fun part of the process to, to find new things to, uh, to show to him and hopefully uh, engage him and, um, you know, get a smile or a little clap of the hands or something like that. But it's, it's better. I mean, I, honestly, if I couldn't work with him, I could, I could occasionally visit him in the trailer. I would still be just as happy, I think. Yeah. Uh, before I let you go, uh, you're a multi-Emmy winner for your work on uh, Boardwalk Empire and Mad Men. What does that recognition mean for you? Um, you know, all of us, I think, who do uh, what we do, uh, start every project saying, how did I get hired for this? I don't actually know. I don't actually know how to do this, and um, and, and so it's nice to to have something that that maybe lets you think. Well, I, I guess I must know what I'm doing because some people said I do. Um, but you always start a project feeling that you know, or almost always that you don't know what you're doing. Certainly, Boardwalk. I've never approached anything like that, and. Um, you know, so to do it, uh, survive it, and then you know get some recognition for it. Um, it's uh, it's very reassuring. I always think it's sort of like years and years ago when um, Ruth Gordon won her um, Oscar for Rosemary's Baby. I mean, I think she was well into her seventies, and her and her Oscar speech. She said like something like, "This is very encouraging to a girl." <laughs> yeah. you know, so there's you know as, as long as i've been doing this there's a a certain uh similar thing of this is very encouraging to a guy you know yeah uh and lastly anything you can tell us about the upcoming sopranos prequel film or are you uh are you uh sworn to silence on that well of course i'm sworn to that. <laughs> um but what's very funny is that it is a prequel so it's not the familiar characters it's the familiar characters but not the familiar actors from the series and right about the time we started and we were you know, in pre-production there was um uh something that was held i forget what theater it was in new york and it was a, a, a q a 20th anniversary thing of meeting the cast of the sopranos and you know Edie falco was there and, and you know tony sirico and all and and all these people and um it was just so funny that they were coming up and asking me <laughs> what it was all about. And this time I was in the position of saying, I can't tell you <laughs> to them. It was like, I'm sorry, Edie, I can't, I can't tell you um, whether or not Carmela is in the script. <laughs> uh, well, so if I can't certainly... tell Edie, I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You know, I had to ask, right? Uh, certainly looking forward to that one. Bob, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations on your work on The Irishman. Uh, it was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.